Okay, six o'clock, we're gonna get the meeting started. Uh, County Council, will you uh, lead the flag salute?
Okay, can we have roll call? Commencing with the oral roll call. Commissioner Grunsky. Present. Commissioner Midgley. Commissioner Hamilton. Present. Commissioner Rustaller. Present. Commissioner Sanga is absent. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, action on requests for continuances or withdrawals. I haven't had any requests for continuances or withdrawals. Okay, very good. At this time, the public is welcome to address the Planning Commission on items of interest to the public that are not listed on the agenda. Anyone want to talk about anything that is not listed on the agenda here or online? Your opportunity for participating remotely through Microsoft Teams or our dial-in number. You can unmute and address the commission for anything that is not on the agenda for this evening. Um, for, for clarification, uh, items that are, if we want to speak regarding the proposed cannabis permit that is on the agenda for tonight, correct? Uh, that is correct, yes. So uh, that will be coming up in a little bit. That item is on the agenda. Okay, thank you, sir. You got it. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, moving on the action items, consent agenda, items calendar for consent will be approved in one motion without a public hearing unless a member of the planning commission or the audience requests that the item be removed from the consent calendar. And these are for items number two, three, and four. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. Commissioner uh, Sanga is absent. Commissioner Midgley. Commissioner Rustaller. Yes. Commissioner Hamilton. Commissioner Grunsky. Yes. Okay, next we have action item one, which is a use permit number PA2100164 in development agreement number PA220028 of Jiang's property management for the cannabis cultivation. And we will hear from... I have, a, I have a Lisa Goulart here to present the project. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. This project includes a use permit to establish a commercial cannabis cultivation and distribution facility utilizing four existing structures. With the use permit, is required is the required development agreement that has been negotiated between the applicant and the county administrator's office. The proposed project is located on the south side of East Navone Road, 3425 feet south of East Fairchild Lane in Stockton. The project site has a general plan designation of general agriculture. And the site is zoned general agriculture with a 40 acre minimum. Project site is adjacent to and accessed through Fairchild Industrial Park located here. This is the industrial park. Otherwise, the surrounding parcels are primarily agriculture with scattered residences. A residential development is located over here, approximately 1,250 feet to the west of the project parcel. This is a schematic depicting uses in the project area with blue dots representing industrial uses and yellow stars representing residences. There are 17 residences within 1,400 feet of the project parcel's perimeter. The nearest residence is 100 feet east of the project parcel and 500 feet east of the project area as the eastern 400 foot portion of the project parcel is not planned for development. Most of the 17 residences are located to the east of the parcel on Arata Road over here, and their access from Fairchild Lane. Orchard trees screen the proposed project from these residences. Residences to the west within 1,400 feet are part of a residential subdivision over here, 
and are separated from the project by both the industrial park and an orchard. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant. The project will utilize existing buildings. The three buildings marked with orange are proposed for cultivation. The building marked with yellow is proposed for distribution. And this building here, the black star, uh, is not part of the project. The buildings on the project site were constructed and used as part of approved projects for olive oil and agricultural processing. Four of the buildings totaling approximately 20,000 square feet will be utilized for the project. Facility operations are planned for seven days a week from 4.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. with two shifts and a maximum of 16 employees per shift. 25 weekly transport trips are anticipated. proposed project site does not meet the standard locational requirement. Sorry. Uh, the proposed project site does not meet the standard locational requirement for a cannabis cultivation project in an agricultural zone, so findings had to be made that the site has sufficient access for an arterial road and for emergency vehicles. The applicant's proposed findings satisfied the Sheriff's Office and Fire District that the site has adequate accessibility, therefore the findings regarding access can be met. Because cannabis is classified as a controlled substance under federal law, any cannabis project proposed in San Joaquin County is unable to participate in the San Joaquin County Multi-Species Habitat and Conservation Plan. As a result, the Community Development Department requires commercial cannabis applicants to have an outside environmental study performed to identify possible biological impacts and proposed mitigation, something normally covered under the Habitat Plan. An initial study prepared by Base Camp Environmental determined that the project site is unlikely to contain any protected plant or animal species as the site has been developed and paved. However, because there are trees that may be removed, a mitigation measure to protect any possible nesting birds during the general nesting season was included and has been incorporated into the recommended conditions of approval for the project. In May 2019, the Board of Supervisors approved an ordinance which permitted commercial cannabis operations with an approved use permit and a commercial cannabis development agreement. This project's negotiated development agreement has a 20-year term and requires the applicant to pay the county two one-time fees totaling $22,500. Additionally, the facility operator is required to pay 3.5% of gross revenues and to hold $20,000 of surety funds in the event of default of gross revenue receipt. In addition to the land use permit <clears throat> and development agreement, commercial cannabis operators also must obtain a commercial cannabis license for each of the cannabis uses to be performed. For this project, that would be a cultivation license and a distribution license. The applicant applies to the Environmental Health Department for these, and at the time they must submit a security plan, a waste destruction plan, an odor control plan, and if applying for a cultivator license, a pesticide use plan. These plans are reviewed by applicable departments, including the Sheriff's Office, the Environmental Health Department, and the Agricultural Commissioner. Additionally, a California state license from the Department of Cannabis Control is required before performing any commercial cannabis activity. All county and state licenses must be renewed annually. 
As already discussed, the Sheriff's Office will review the submitted security plan as part of the licensing process. The Sheriff's Office, in a letter from October 2021, listed requirements for a security plan that included fencing, security guards, and surveillance and alarm systems. In a February 2022 letter, the Sheriff's Office disclosed that a person associated with the project's corporate applicant was facing criminal charges related to an illegal cannabis operation that's not associated with this project. That person has since given his resignation from the corporation board, stating that he would have no further involvement with the company's management, operations, policies, or practices. The Community Development Department received letters from five neighbors opposing the project and a letter from a company located in the industrial park questioning the project's impacts on water and power supply. The property locations of the letter writers are uh, depicted with blue dots on the site plan. The letters raise concerns regarding security and criminal activity, environmental issues, odors, traffic, property values, and the project's impacts on water and power supply. With regards to security issues and neighborhood crime, the applicant is required to have an approved security plan with the Sheriff's Office in place prior to occupancy of the buildings. The neighbor's concerns that a cannabis site will attract criminals to their neighborhood is beyond the scope of our review. The subject property is zoned AG40 and county regulations permit commercial cannabis uses in this zone with an approved use permit and development agreement. With regards to environmental issues, the initial study prepared by Base Camp Environmental did not find any environmental impacts from the project that could not be mitigated to a less than significant impact. This includes air quality, water supply, and energy uses. With, regard, with, excuse me, with regards to air quality impacts, Air Pollution Control District has set thresholds for emission pollutants and estimator models rated the project's emissions below every emission threshold. With regards to water supply pursuant to the initial study, the project's calculated annual water usage of approximately 1 million gallons is just a fraction of the estimated 50 million gallons held in the subbasin from which the project's new well will draw. Estimated electricity usage is also not likely to impact overall energy supplies. With regards to odor concerns, all commercial cannabis activities must be performed indoors and must have an odor control plan approved by the Environmental Health Department. An odor control plan will include a commercial HVAC and air filtration system, carbon filters, and other components that will ensure impacts to the surrounding area will be less than significant. With regards to traffic, the Department of Public Works determined the project did not require a traffic study as it was not expected to exceed 50 vehicle trips during any hour. With regards to the project's impact on surrounding property values, this too is beyond the scope of our review and it's not addressed in the regulatory framework for commercial cannabis. photo is taken from North Navone Road, looking south at the front of the project site. This photo is taken from East Navone Road, looking south at the driveway into the facility. This photo is taken from in front of the project site, looking across the street. This photo is taken inside the project site, looking at building number one, which will be used for cultivation. This is a photo of buildings number three and four to be used for cultivation and distribution.
And this photo is of building number five, also to be used for cultivation. It is recommended that the Planning Commission forward the mitigated negative declaration to the Board of Supervisors with a recommendation of approval, forward the mitigation monitoring and reporting plan to the Board of Supervisors with a recommendation of approval, forward development agreement number PA2200028 to the Board of Supervisors with a recommendation of approval, forward the findings for use permit to the Board of Supervisors with a recommendation of approval, and forward use permit number PA2100164 with the conditions of approval contained in the staff report to the Board of Supervisors with the recommendation of approval based on the ability to make the required findings. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. That was a good presentation. Uh, any question from the staff from the Planning Commission? Yes. Can we go back to the site plan, please? One more, I believe. There are several, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Which one? In uh, go to the next one, if you would, please. Okay. Um, house number where it says AG forty. The, the, how f you didn't give a number on that? How far that away is distance-wise from the project? Uh, the distance between that home there and the project. I didn't. Uh, the closest one is. That is um, 100 feet away. Oh, thank you. 100 feet away, and it's this one here. So this one is a little bit further, and I would say it's probably a half mile. Uh, and then the 17 others you said were within 1,400 feet. The, the blue circle is a 1,400 foot. And. What are, the, what are the county's parameters for notifying people as far as the number of feet of the project? Uh, that's exactly it, 1,400 feet so, in this zone. Okay. So the people with the, uh, with the white homes here with the uh, yellow stars, how far away are they from the project? Um, are we talking about over here? The Yes, yes. Uh, that is... Um, Closest is 1,400 feet. Okay. The closest is? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go through the chart. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like the closest, if that blue line is the 1,400 foot radius that we okay, so, notify, it looks like they're about. So the people to the, here, so to the two people to the west and over here in that subdivision were not notified. Um, just the two. Okay, so no, no one else. No one else in that subdivision? Correct. Think of a scope of this project that the plan is farther to everybody realized possibly coming in there any precedent when we do we ever expand is it something we look at in the future if it's a controversial topic of expanding the specific development title notification what we do is if there are pieces of the project or people call in to request notification in that sense, we do end up providing more notice than the mandated 1,400 square feet, but it's done through either request or potentially a group that has joined or something like that. So but I don't think it's square feet. It's it's just feet, not square feet. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's 1,400 feet from the. Okay. Um, in fact, they're round feet according to the circle. Sorry. From the. I was meant the required parcel. notification feet. I apologize. So. Um, the name of the road is Devoni. I'm sorry. By the way. Just to is it? Oh. So just the ones in the blue circle were notified of this project. 
Yes. Nobody coming off a fair yes. trial. So well, no, none of the homes off a of fair trial that'll be affected by traffic. Is that uh, true? No one who is up on fair trial was notified. Like subdivision. Yes, if their parcel is within the circle. Okay, that'll be. Thank you. Commissioner Rustaller, from Midgley, anything? Okay, and we already have the staff recommendation. So now we will open it up to, excuse me, here. Public comment, public hearing procedures. And first we're gonna hear from the applicant and or the applicant representative. And please state your name. Chair Gretzky and members of the commission, good evening, thank you for the opportunity to be heard. I'm Zach Trevon, an attorney before you on behalf of the applicant, JKL Sunshine Corporation. I'd like to start by personally addressing the reason for our requested continuance ahead of the originally scheduled hearing. Just prior to that hearing, we discovered the February and June letters from the Sheriff's Office indicating their concern over individuals associated with the application being involved in illegal cultivation. We were then advised by Sheriff's Office personnel that one of the company's executives, Kevin Chen, was being charged with illegal cultivation. In discussing this matter with Mr. Chen and the company's board, it was determined that Mr. Chen should resign immediately from his position with the company, which he did on July 25th. I simply emphasize that Mr. Chen's situation has nothing to do with the company itself, the subject property of this application, its development, or its future operations. And although these charges are still pending, and despite Mr. Chen having absolutely no criminal record whatsoever, at this point, he is not a part of the company. Now as to the project itself, a few high level points as to the nature of the project and its proposed operations. First would be that construction of improvements and operations on site will be limited to the interior of the existing facility structures, number one, three, four, and five, meaning that no cannabis activity whatsoever will be conducted outdoors and no disturbance to the neighbors should result from on-site operations, especially since adjacent residences are buffered either by orchards and or ag facilities such as packing sheds. Next would be the discrete nature of these operations themselves. And I think this is a fundamental misunderstanding of some of the opponents perhaps. As cultivation and distribution operation with a maximum of 15 employees per shift, there will be no access to the site for the general public and no customers going back and forth. Site traffic will be limited to employees going to and from work, as well as limited transport of product samples and shipments with a maximum anticipated total of 25 trips per week, in addition to any governmental agencies that come on for inspections or visits. Security at the facility will be substantial with a secondary low voltage electrified fence proposed as an additional barrier securing the site perimeter, at least one 24 hour security guard, which is a condition of our approval, as well as 24 hour 365 degree surveillance of both the interior and exterior of the facility with nighttime security lighting and burglar alarms to be activated during off hours with the facility to remain locked at all times except as necessary for personnel access. Environmental protection measures to be implemented will include odor control with industrial carbon filtration units integrated into the facility HVAC system to ensure no odor of cannabis will escape the facility and no disturbance to the neighbors in this regard will occur. We'll be using drip irrigation for watering the plants with all condensate to be captured and recycled to minimize water use, which will have a minimal effect to the existing water basin. Additionally, although all plants all plant nutrients to be utilized will be 100% organic as required by the state. All irrigation runoff will be collected, stored, and hauled off site with no wastewater discharge to the soil or the facility septic system. As to the opposition from several of the neighbors who I think you'll hear from tonight, it seems like most stems from a belief that traffic coming and going from the facility will include both customers from the general public and criminals looking for an opportunity to victimize the facility. One letter even cites a current lack of security in the Fairchild Industrial Park, which is a circumstance that will be remedied with the introduction of this facility's operations. My experience working with these businesses for the last six and a half years, invariably the security at these facilities serves to benefit their surroundings, including several instances where security elements contributed to the alleviation of criminal activity in the area of operations. We commonly see these projects become subject to similar opposition prior 
the commencement of operations due to the lingering stigma around cannabis. I think the main issue is a fundamental lack of understanding the difference in nature between unregulated illegal operations and state licensed locally permitted operations which are heavily regulated by multiple government agencies and whose owners must all pass background checks through the county and state before being approved for a business license. But while we are sensitive to the neighbor's concerns and fully intend to be attentive and responsive to any future complaints which we don't anticipate, we do not agree that there is a substantial basis in this regard to consider denying the project for approval. We've reviewed all conditions of approval and are ready and willing to abide by these as well as all laws and regulations concerning this operation moving forward. That, considering the project meets all relevant criteria, I'd ask that you please adopt staff's recommendation with a vote to recommend approval of the mitigated negative declaration and mitigated mitigation monitoring plan, conditional use permit with proposed conditions and necessary findings as well as a development agreement with the Board of Supervisors. I thank you for your time and with a reservation of my remaining time for rebuttal, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. It's the hours of operation. Is it similar to the, what the Olive Mill was doing? Is it 4.36 p.m.? Is that what, yeah, it, what we, it is? We kept them broad, 4.30 to 6 p.m. Um, a lot of that will be downtime. These plants need to be monitored, as do the, uh, the lighting systems, to make sure the lighting doesn't go down. Um, but other than that, yeah, those are the hours, 4.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. And, and this is just for growing, essentially? There's no... Uh, Convert, is it convert into oils or anything like that, or is it just uh, no manufacturing whatsoever? No, no manufacturing. Okay, so it's just the growing of the leaf, pretty much. Just growing weed and just yeah, the wholesale. Got it. Okay. Say your transportation trips are twenty-five weekly trips, logistics trips primarily. Yeah, that doesn't count uh, the uh, employees coming and going from work. All right. So you got twenty-five trucks, and they leave your facility and come back. More likely than not, uh, there will be some pickups of our product from the facility to be distributed into the wholesale market. But with us having distribution as part of this operation, that allows us to um, not only process the uh, flower as part of the cultivation license, but also package, label it. Uh, we would dispatch a lab testing facility to come take samples to make sure that it passes the state's criteria for introduction into the commercial market. And then once that uh, certificate of uh, compliance was received, we could then send it out into the market either to other uh, wholesale distributors or directly to retailers. Okay, so 25 be your max or your minimum? Maximum. Plus the 15 employees? Correct. I'm just trying to find out how much traffic is going to be dumped on Fairchild Road. So. Math. I'd say with employees, if I had to give an estimate, Probably 35 trips max, including the employees. I think that there's going to be a lot of carpooling. Thank you. So, um, Commissioner Hamilton brought up the, the folks who live on the east side, and two of those residents are fairly, actually, very close to the proposed facility. And, you know, I think um, if I was that close, I definitely would want to have a total understanding of how you're going to mitigate the odor. Um, even in my own neighborhood, those who decide to grow on the outside, you, there's a certain time of year where you know it isn't a colony sure. of skunks in the neighborhood. So can you explain how it works? Sure. So the industrial carbon filters, they, they sit on the cultivation floor of all of the grow rooms. So these, the grow rooms, the way they're constructed is, is a box within a box. So the material that's used to construct the grow rooms themselves, it's pre, uh, prefabricated insulated cold storage paneling. And so within those boxes within the uh, facility envelope, uh, we set probably three to five industrial carbon filters inside rooms that range between 1,200 and 1,500 square feet. And those run, and as those run, the HVAC system coupled with circular fans around the perimeter, they circulate air through those carbon filters and it scrubs it of the odor. And so outside of harvest time, even if you're outside of one of the grow rooms inside of the building, you can smell a faint smell of cannabis, but when you're outside of the building envelope, it's very, very hard to detect the smell of cannabis, if, if any is detectable at all. So the buildings that are proposed, they're both on the outside of the total plan, if I'm reading it right. They're cultivation rooms, 170, 7,000 square feet, the other 39 
change. Um, are you are they going to actually change the buildings themselves? No, not not at all. It's all going to be interior improvements to those existing structures. So like building three, for example, there'll be six grow rooms inside of that uh, space, three on either side of a central corridor. And then in buildings one and buildings five, there's going to be a number of smaller cultivation rooms inside of those existing envelopes. So each of those will have industrial carbon filters integrated with the heating and cooling systems. And, and second interior, basically, to encompass. Correct. Like, Correct. So one last question. Has your client sort of reached out to any of the folks who live on the east side, especially the ones that are so close? I actually went and knocked on doors uh, ahead of the, the first hearing, and uh, I had an informational pamphlet about the facility itself. I spoke to a couple of the neighbors. One of them, I believe, was Ms. Francis Pisano. Uh, just do my best to explain the nature of the operation, and I don't think I was successful in gaining her support, but I did want to reach out. I provided my contact information. If they had any concerns or questions about the project, I did offer my contact information and, and encourage them to reach out. Thank you. And actually, one of them did. I think her, her daughter reached out after the fact. Uh, question. A um, couple that live on, live Close to building number three, they will never smell the marijuana coming out of there. Not from, They're only 100 and something feet. Not from this operation, no. I mean, I think part of uh, the issue in our area, right, is that around October, cannabis cultivation, uh, illegal personal use, whatever it is, it's ubiquitous, right? And so those types of operations are unregulated. For us, if we receive a complaint about an offensive odor, that's going to go straight to code enforcement. So given the investment at hand and the prospective operation moving forward, it's wholly within our interest to make sure that those issues are, are managed appropriately and that the odor is controlled. And, you know, we have gotten entitlements at, you know, facility off Fremont and Stockton, several in, uh, in North Modesto and industrial parks. And literally, if you're standing, if, if the carbon filters are operational and running uh, as they should, like they actually also have, uh, you can change the filters out of those. If you're keeping up on the maintenance of those filters, you cannot smell cannabis outside of these indoor cultivation facilities. And thank you. So you've had a couple of these up and running here in San Joaquin County at this time, right? Or, I mean, uh, you're, you've had clients or... There's one facility in Stockton City proper that was the first entitlement that came down. That was June of 2017. It's on San Juan Avenue. That's a much larger 30,000 square foot facility. Um, that one, I, there's a $10 million investment into that. Now it's fully built out. I think there's 10 indoor cultivation rooms. And has there, uh, is that in, in the county or is that the city? It's in the city proper. City proper, okay. The one in, I think it's Lockford, that, that's just starting to get going, right, as Correct. far as cultivation? That's currently under construction. It's under construction still, okay. I was just curious if there has been, does anyone know about any code enforcement from the city of Stockton? Is that something, because that would be the only test space we have of a similar operation. Javon probably has more experience with whether he's had complaints lodged against one of his facilities. That may be something he yeah. could address. Have you had any, any complaints from any neighbors on the Fremont, or is that not up and running? Nothing? None, none that I've heard, no. Okay. And there's actually uh, legal non-conforming residential uses directly across the street from that facility. I'm talking like 25 feet door to door, maybe 50 feet door to door. Um, and yeah, there's no complaints. We actually had those neighbors come and ask for jobs once the facility was up and running. But okay, okay, thank you. Any uh, any other questions? Or question. Yeah. Um, the, the facility you have in Stockton proper is. Uh, do you have any homes nearby? Yes, there are homes directly across the street, with no buffer. So the outside is just going to have the existing buildings, really. The no, Commissioner Midgley, the, the only, I think, structural difference is going to be the secondary perimeter fence that we put up for additional security. Okay, if that's it, we'll move on to, uh, thank you, I think, uh, I think that we got everything answered up here. Thank you. We'll move on to the proponents of the project, if there is any online. This is your opportunity for participating through our Microsoft team to dial in. You wish to speak in favor of the project. This is item number one, use permit number PA-2. 
210164 is your opportunity to unmute and address the commission. I'm seeing no online participation for proponents of the project. Okay, now we'll open it up to opponents of the project. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, my name is Steve Harum. I represent the Bizzano family. I've handed out some material to you, which are some of the facts I'm going to present to you tonight. And I have six points I'd like to emphasize, if I may. Uh, the first one is that the environmental review and the staff report dispensed with analyzing a serious environmental effect. There's a new issue that's been arise. It came out of San Luis Obispo in Santa Barbara County, where I do some work, is that cannabis uses have a horrible effect on wine grapes and end up destroying them. And in this area, there are a lot of cherries, and cherries are just as vulnerable as wine grapes. And I point out my, my, my first statement is from Dr. Anita Obergrim, a PhD who's on the UC faculty of viticulture and enology. And she ends up saying that cannabis operations can have a potentially significant impact on the terrapin composition of wine grapes growing near cannabis cultivation sites. And she said the changes in the terrapin composition of wine grapes have been shown to result in wine quality. The same thing could be true of cherries that are growing in that particular area. And I would point out that in addition to that, in the San Luis Obispo CEQA documents, where they had some of these problems, reached the conclusion that odors affect the long-term wineries' crops and interfere with their use of property. Now, my point to you is this, is there's nothing in the environmental review or in the staff report that addresses this issue. It's silent on that. And it's not enough to be silent on it. You need to evaluate this potential environmental effect before you make a recommendation. And you have one of the leading authorities in the world, uh, Dr. Oberlin, telling you that it does have an effect on crops like grapes and cherries. You have S San Luis Obispo County Planning Department doing a staff report that says that. And keep in mind two things. Number one is the, uh, uh, as I'll point out later on, the local health department, excuse me, the, the air, air district also said there's an air pollution problem in terms of odors, and they looked at this exact project. And there's a requirement that there be an odor plan in this case, which I'll talk about later as well. But my point to you here is very simple. I know that you're going to hear from Attorney Duran afterwards say, well, it's all fully enclosed. Well, stop and wait a minute. If it's all fully enclosed, number one, the air, the regional air district looked at it and said it could still be a public nuisance and it still could create odors. And they looked at this exact project. So you have the testimony of the attorney representing the applicant telling you it's not a problem. He's not an engineer and an odor expert. And you've got people that specialize in that, the regional district, telling you that there's a chance for a public nuisance and an odor problem out there. You need to study that further. There's no reason for you to disregard the opinion of the regional air district and accept the opinion of the attorney that there's not going to be an odor problem. And if there's no odor problem, why are they being required to have an odor plan? It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. So my first point is very simple, is that cannabis ends up damaging certain crops such as grapes and cherries and that is an interference with other people's property rights, which is a constitutionally protected right, and that needs to be addressed before you move on this project. The second point is that the application defers very important studies. Four studies are deferred, and they shouldn't be. The odor study, the pesticide study, the fire mitigation plan, and the security plan. So you don't know exactly what's going to be done. They say they're going to have security and it's going to be taken care of, but that's a plan that's going to be done after the permit is granted. It will be done without a public hearing, without any public input, and we don't know whether it's really going to work or not. 
you cannot say that that security plan, which is the mitigation, is sufficient at this point because you don't know what it is and you will never see it and you'll never know what it is. So you're approving a project where you conclude there's no security problem because there's a security plan, but you don't know what the plan is. The same is true of odor. Basically, you say, we'll have an odor plan, and that'll take care of the problem. I'll never see that plan. You'll never see that plan. No member of the public will ever see that plan. It will all be done in closed doors. We have a right to know what the odor plan is to make sure it's going to reduce the odor problem. We have a right to see the security plan to make sure it's going to provide security out there. It's not enough to say, well, we'll do a plan later on, but no one's going to see it or know about it. That's not fair to you, and it's not fair to my clients and other members of the public. Third, I don't think you can trust this applicant. Now, let's, now, let's put the skunk on the table. The head of this company has been indicted for a felony for violating controlled substance laws. That's pretty doggone serious. I don't know about you, but I can tell you in the company I own, I've never had one of the owners or one of the people that work for me indicted on a felony. I don't know whether you have or not. I suspect not. And if the person running the company is willing to violate the, the controlled substance laws, that tells you something about the corporate culture of that company. And I would simply say, having just read a book on, 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 uh, on Al Capone, I learned that Al Capone never was a, an officer, a, a director of any of the companies he owned. There's nothing to prevent this man from being back in the company the day after this permit is issued. So if they're going to violate state criminal laws, why do we think they're going to, not, they're going to abide by the conditions of this use permit? It's a corporate cultural problem, and we have no certainty they're going to follow the law. They seem not to since they're under indictment right now, and I think you need to be worried about that. At a minimum, you should require all sorts of annual reviews of this company, and there's, no, there's nothing that prevents that man from getting back in the company the day after you recommend approval of this permit. The fourth point is nuisance. Who are you going to believe? Uh, the applicant's attorney said there is no problem. But not everyone agrees with him. At point number four, the San Joaquin Air District uh, looked at this exact permit, this exact plan, and read what they concluded. They concluded the proposal creates the strong public nuisance potential. And that's very serious. And that's from your staff report at pay, at, at, from the CEQA review at three, page eight. Further on, the, the CEQA document that was prepared for by the developer reaches this conclusion. Odors are an issue with cannabis operations. So to say there's not going to be an odor problem is, is not agreed to by the experts, the Air District and the consultant that did the EIR review. The Air District tells you this is the possibility of being a public nuisance, having looked at this exact proposal. And the developer's own paid for environmental review says that odors are associated with these sort of uses. And so I, I would argue to you that you need to do an EIR in this case. You have such a dispute of, of what people are telling you, you should not disregard what the Air District tells you. You should not disregard what the CEQA document tells you. You should require an EIR and get enough information so you can make a decision and a recommendation based on all the facts instead of just what the attorney representing the applicant told you. Fifth, you have a, a private road problem. Uh, the, the CEQA document indicates that, 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 acts, that, that emergency access will be done on public roads. That's what the CEQA document says at page 3-45. Yet, eight page later, it tells you that Navoni Road is a private road. So maybe today there's not a problem with fire and emergency if something happens out there, but the county and the fire district have no control over what happens to the maintenance and repair of Navoni Road. So maybe it's okay today. It may not be tomorrow. That's why the criteria that the county established for these says you should have public roads so you know that they're going to be maintained in case there's a fire or an emergency there. You're trusting that this road in perpetuity is always going to be maintained and repaired. That's why the policy discourages private roads and the EI and the CEQA document here acknowledges that it's a private road, it's not a public road, and that could pose a problem in the future. 
And number six, I would just indicate to you that I do not believe that the mandatory findings which, which are presented to you in the staff report at Exhibit D, pages three and four, can be met. And I'd really focus on three of the five of them, if I may, quickly. Number three is that the site is physically suitable for the type of development and for the density. And I think you can't answer that in the affirmative, which you have to do, because we don't have an odor plan. You have the Air District saying that it could be a public nuisance. You have CEQA documents from San Luis Obispo saying it will cause an odor problem. And you don't have the information before you to tell you whether or not you can make that finding or not. But certainly the experts are telling you from the planning department in San Luis Obispo, from the professor from UC Davis, and from the Air District, that there is an odor problem that can affect agriculture in that area. And there's no work on that. Again, that's not a criticism of the staff analysis. This is a relatively new issue in California that we're facing as more and more cannabis uses become proliferated. Uh, finding four cannot be made and that it's not detrimental to the health, safety, welfare, welfare, or injurious to the property improvements of adjacent properties. Again, here, uh, it's going to damage cherry crops. We don't know to what extent because the study hasn't been done. You need to study that so that those cherry crops are not ruined because of this, and we just don't know. And the final one is it's compatible with adjoining uses. That's not true at all. I mean, heavens to Betsy. Uh, you know, read what they're doing in terms of their in terms of their safety. They're putting up walls. They're having security guards. They're having this. There's no problem. Why do you need all of that? And I simply ask you a simple question: Would you want that next to your house? If it's so safe and it's not a problem, and it's not incompatible with the other uses, why would you do that? So, in sum, I, I, and my clients will also be addressing you. Uh, I simply ask you to either number one require an EIR because there are significant unanswered environmental issues here so that you do not have the data and information to make a recommendation. Or if you want to proceed, you should recommend disapproval of this application because it has serious issues with the adjoining community. There are not answers to important questions and until we get answers to those questions, this application could be, should be denied. Uh, I can attempt to answer any questions you may have. Was the uh, was the study on an outdoor operation or indoor operation? Do you uh, know? Uh, well, the, the, there were both in San Luis Obispo. Yeah, the one that we're quoting. There's yeah. indoor and outdoor. Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo, they've had both indoor and outdoor. And what San Luis Obispo said is they, at this point, have a virtual prohibition on cannabis uses near grapes. They're very concerned about their grape growing industry, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. They're just saying, we don't want cannabis near where grapes are being grown. And they, Santa Barbara's been more liberal, but San Luis Obispo's taken a very tight look at that. But the study did not differentiate. They do have outdoor growing, which I don't believe we have here, correct? No, it's, it's not out growing, but I mean, you've got the air district saying but it's it is an odor issue. Yeah, I understand. But the study is, but the actual study is, was for indoor and outdoor, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, but the key here is the, the, the Air District looked at this exact use, understanding it was indoor, and the Air District concluded it could be a public nuisance problem, and the CEQA document said odors are associated as it studied this exact use. So you have a really serious open question on that that needs to be answered before you proceed. So how, of the study that you quote, do um, you have a number of how many of the outdoor uh, operations were observed and analyzed versus those that were indoor? I do not. I'm sorry. So I have another question. So there are different licenses that need to be applied for, correct? Yes. So the security plan must go through the sheriff's office. Yes. Wouldn't someone have a, a citizen, neighbor, uh, an interested party have the opportunity to review that safety plan no. once the ceremony? No, that's not how it works. They would never, they would never know about it. Uh, it ought to be part of this permit application. You should review it and we should review it because you're being asked to conclude that there's not a security problem because they have a security plan and the only evidence you have is they're going to submit some plan to the sheriff. If I were a commissioner trying to discharge my public duty, I would be very concerned 
say, well, I haven't even seen it. How do I know if it's good enough or not? It hasn't been vetted by the public. So let me ask the question that of the other approved uh, operations in San Joaquin County um, have the same objections brought up about not being able to review a security plan or the waste plan or any other plans that you're aware of? I'm the wrong person to answer that. To be very honest with you, Mr. Dervon spent many months trying to convince me to work with him on these matters, and I declined to. And uh, I've kind of stayed out of the marijuana business, if you'll excuse the phrase. And so this is the first time I've appeared uh, on, on a uh, marijuana use. So, and I do realize that you were talking about the person who has been indicted and he is no longer part of the operations. Um, but you would also agree that this person has not been convicted of anything at this time. So there is, in this country, right, the benefit is in that person's favor as until they are proven guilty of a crime. Isn't that what? The way the system and, works. And, and, and what the sheriff in, in his initial letter said, you should continue this until that criminal proceeding was concluded. Um, that's, draw whatever conclusion you want from that. Yeah, no, no, he's not been convicted, absolutely. But I don't have anyone working with me who's under indictment right now. Well, he's no longer working with the organization. No, but he's not, but he could tomorrow, the day after this hearing, he could again. There's nothing to prevent them from putting him right back in the same position the day afterwards. Or there's no way we don't know there's an outside agreement like Al Capone. He's actually running the company, but he's just not. The mere fact he's not on the board of directors anymore doesn't mean that he's still not running the company. Thank you. Anyone else from the commission? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other, I'm sure we have some other opponents of the project. Um, and I do have a, uh, the, what's it called where I say I talk to someone? Yeah, I was going to say confession. And it's not, <laughs> <laughs> no confessions, but I do encourage disclosures. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Bonzano, who I think will be speaking, um, uh, called me and voiced some concerns. And I said we would hear it out today, but he did. I did talk to him for briefly two, three minutes or something, and that was it. But I'm sure he's going to be speaking, so I just wanted to disclose that. Confession. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, any other uh, opponents of the project? Hi, my name is uh, Robert McGlory, and I live probably within that 1,400 feet. Um, our um, cherries and our land is east of it and uh, we have a two-story home and they were talking about lighting well i was wondering uh, what kind of lighting it's going to be if it's approved because that would be a public nuisance to me because we our bedroom is upstairs we have a uh, balcony with a sliding door and in the summertime we like to leave it oh, the slider with the screen locked at night to get fresh air in and if it's going to have lighting throughout the facility, is it going to be like a jailbreak? So we'll see. We can walk through our house without putting on any lights. To me, that's a nuisance. And I think that it should be considered. If you lived in that area, how would you like it that when you went to bed, you, you shut off your lights and you can still walk around in your bedroom? That's, that's one of my concerns. We also have cherries. And again, it's a thin uh, skin crop. And as stated before, we are concerned about the production of the cherries and the ability to sell the product because even though you say there's no odor problem, there's going to be odor. I don't care how. There's always going to be some odor uh, regardless. Another thing we wanted to talk, I wanted to talk about was security. I know they have great security around their facility, but right now the way it's set up at the industrial park there's a gate there with a keypad, but it doesn't work. That gate is open 24 hours a day, and we have people that do side shows at night. We can hear them peeling out in that area. Um, and uh, we call the, for response, and sometimes we get a response, and other times nothing, because the sheriff department doesn't have enough staff to come out. We had a guy try to break into our, we have a gate in front of our house, and we have a call box, and at one in the morning or 
earlier than that, actually, about 12.30 in the morning, he was trying to get into our house through, by hitting the keypad, but he didn't know the number. We don't know if he was on drugs or what. We called the sheriff department to come out to take a look at it. And do you know that our, um, I went to bed. He was there over 45 minutes trying to get in. My cameras, we have cameras out in front, showed an hour and a half later a sheriff car came by. And so my concern is if we do get someone to, that decides to walk through at night and finds, you know, this facility and, and it's protected, they're not going to go there, they may decide, it doesn't have to be at night, they may decide to go through the orchard and we could get burglarized or who knows what. So it's the undesirable people that we worry about as well. Another thing is that down the street from us, there was a honey, uh, what do they call it, honey lab, so to speak, and it caught fire. And the fire department had to come out to put it out, the Waterloo Marotta Fire Department. But do you know that they don't have enough staff that it took three companies to come out to put that fire out? I know they're not make, having a honey lab uh, or producing any of that product, but my concern is if there was to be some type of fire, you know, would our little fire department be able to handle something there? That's something we need to consider as well. And then, like I said earlier, we are concerned about the, our land values, the ability to sell our cherries, and just our way of life is going to change. And we certainly want you, I would love to have you put yourself in my place, and how would you feel if you lived there and found out this was happening? Thank you. Thank you. And, and just for any other speakers, we, it is a five-minute limit, just so we, so we know. I don't think you hit it, but I'm just so warning. Any other uh, opponents of the project like to come up and speak? Hello, my name is Richard Lozano. Uh, <clears throat> I reside at 3000 North Arata. There's approximately 1,000 feet from the proposed project. As a farmer, I work with all different types of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. We also have the problem of restocking of uh, ex excessive nitrates in our water. It's really one problem, and the last thing we did, another problem in our water because I don't think people really know what's going to happen with this stuff on a commercial basis. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for taking my testimony. Absolutely. Thank you. Any questions? No, I think we're good. Any other opponents of the project? No. Attendance? Hello, everyone. I'm Frances Bizzano. I'm his wife. <laughs> I'm speaking here today as a retired educator, taking a little different slant on this. My children attended Linden Unified. I taught in Linden Unified. With, within two miles of this processing plant are two elementary schools. One to the east is Glenwood on Alpine Road. To the west is Waverly on Wilmarth Road. The children that go to those two schools live right around this processing plant. This is where they draw from. The people that go to Glenwood and the children live on Baldwin Road. They live on White Lane. They live on Arata. They live on Fairchild. They live on Highway 88. They come home, and right around them is a marijuana processing 
went. Now, I'm not even sure if the parents are even aware that this processing plant is going to be there and if they might have concerns about their children being so near a plant like that, so near. Many teachers in Linden Unified, because it's a rural community and raises a lot of crops, take their students on field trips to processing plants to see them packing cherries, walnuts, apples. I don't really think these teachers would be able to bring these students to this processing plant. Why not? <laughs> Public education has been a champion in a program to stop the use of drugs in schools. Say no to drugs has been a big push in our schools. And marijuana is considered a gateway drug. If we just look at what's happened in our society, our young people are escalating, the numbers are escalating with the use of drugs. It should be a concern of all parents, the schools, everyone, to try to make something better. In closing, if this processing plant is approved, we're sending the wrong message to these children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Robert Milliori Jr., I guess. Um, sorry, I didn't know I was gonna be. I, uh, so, as the, uh, the lawyer for the marijuana Cultivation stated that they will be starting at 4.30 a.m. I can only assume that um, when I work in the logistics industry, I work for Cherokee Freight Lines, many times trucks will be getting there probably around 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. It takes them around an hour to load. They'll be leaving right around the time that many parents, many teachers are taking their children to school to work. They're getting off of Navoni Road heading towards Fairchild, or no, sorry, heading towards Waterloo Road, it's there's no light there. It really just kind of becomes a game of hoping that the light down uh, the light down at Alpine is red just when you're about to leave. I could see that in this case, it could increase commute times for the people heading into Stockton from the kind of from the county area between uh, in Stockton and Linden. It could increase their commute times when heading into town. And on top of that, as it was stated earlier, um, there is a gate there. There is a keypad that does not work. However, it should also be noted that the gate that uh, blocks off Navoni Road only goes the front of the road. The gate essentially right here, if I so, if someone so desired, they could just go right around it. It's not really a proper, so the, while security at the facility may be true, sorry, it may be there, there is an actual concern of people still getting onto Navoni Road. As you heard earlier, there are sideshows, there's cars that are, they race late at night, and sometimes they do crash. That, all right, like I said, I didn't prepare for this at all. All good, thank you very much. Good evening, uh, my name is George Picardo, and our residence is on Fairchild Lane, Fairchild Road, just east of Alpine. We also are involved in a business that's not too far from the, uh, the proposed plant, and that would be on uh, Alpine Road near the railroad tracks. Um, 
My biggest, well, there were other concerns here that I totally agree with. And the one I didn't think about was the fire district, Water and Murata. Um, I didn't hear anything about anybody looking into the, if there was a fire hazard there, how would that be mitigated, number one. And then secondly, our biggest concern is the traffic. Um, I don't think we need to look up at the uh, site plan again, but the exit from Navoni Road onto Fairchild Road is only a one-tenth of a mile from the stop sign where uh, Fairchild in, in it intersects with uh, Waterloo Road. And many times during the afternoon or during the day, there's a line coming out all the way from Waterloo Road to Navoni Road, and the traffic's backed up there. And this is just going to exasperate that because uh, we just can't deal with any more traffic there. And so that is a big concern and a sa safety problem uh, that we have. And the other thing that I noticed when it was talking about the traffic with the existing operation there, uh, 24 hours a day, that, that was only a seasonal business. It wasn't year round. It was only a seasonal during cherries and sometimes when during the olive crush season, if I understood that slide right. So that is why we're opposed uh, along with the other reasons, but specifically the safety from the traffic standpoint. So thank you for your time and consideration. Of course, thank you. Anyone else in attendance that would like to speak? Hello, my name's Lisa Schladewitz, Richard and Fran Bazzano's daughter. So I have many concerns. Um, number one, uh, and when Mr. Rivon came to speak with us, I called him and I specifically asked him, well, how does this affect the property value? We just built a custom home. We moved from the Bay Area. And he said, well, I can't, I can't tell you that. We don't know that. That's my first question. How does this affect property value and orchard value? My biggest other concern is security or uh, is safety. I have called numerous times. We have had numerous issues with people racing, dumping on our property, et cetera. I've called the CHP, the sheriff. And they simply just, they, they're like, we can't get there. We, you know, we can't get there on time unless you can get a, a picture of the license plate. Now, now I don't want to be worrying about crime. I have a child that lives at home. We have enough issues between the fact that over the last 10 years, I've gotten no support from the police department with any kind of help towards um, vandalism or people on the property, et cetera, racing down the street. I just feel like this is just a negative effect. I don't understand the security plan. So, so they have a security plan. My question is, what's the security plan for the residents? We, ha we have a gate that doesn't work. We have supposedly a, an armed guard they're going to have um, at the marijuana distribution plant. Um, the other thing is these trucks, what, what's not to stop people vandalizing these trucks when they leave uh, and picking up and coming back? What's the plan for that? How are they going to prevent any kind of robbery to that effect? So I, I just see this as a negative. I think it's bad for the school district. Um, like I said, uh, my, how does this affect our property value? We don't know that. We don't know how. We know it's a negative effect on our um, orchards, et cetera, but the property value is the number one question that hasn't come up. So, I, I mean, I, I don't see these going up in Brookside or nice neighborhoods. So um, just because this is an urban area, this isn't the place for it. And I really hope you guys see through our eyes how we feel knowing that this would be near your property. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents in attendance? I think we got everyone, actually. I think pretty much everyone spoke. Uh, anyone online? If you're participating through a Microsoft Teams or dial-in, this is your opportunity to unmute and address the commission if you are in opposition of the project. Hello, I would like to speak. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh, my name is Anthony Bozano. I cannot be there tonight, but um, I, I farm both in uh, Stockton with my parents as well as in Santa Barbara County and San Luis Obispo County. And there's a few items that I would like to cover 
as, as part of this that uh, pertain to ag. And, and there's some that pertain to security as well. But let's start with ag. As, as Mr. Harum pointed out, the, ter the terpene odors do pose a dangerous risk to grapes. And I understand what Mr. Dervon say it says that they do not and that they are contained and scrubbed. I witnessed it firsthand, and I witnessed it firsthand every single year in Santa Maria Valley and in the Santa Rita Hills AVA outside of Buellton and Lompoc, where we're harvesting grapes at the same time as cannabis is ripe. We have indoor grows down here. We have outdoor grows. You can smell it outside of the outdoor grows just the same. Professionally, I also work with wine grapes and I work with wine. I can attest, just like Anita from UC Davis, that those odors affect the quality of wine grapes and therefore they affect the value of wine grapes. There have not been studies done on how those odors are going to affect cherries or, you know, there's another, there's another high value crop that is immediately next door to this grow site, which is walnuts. We have not seen how those odors are going to potentially affect our cherries or our walnuts. These crops are our livelihoods. Uh, they're Mr. Picardo's livelihoods. They're Mr. Migliori's livelihoods and countless other neighbors that are not there tonight because they do not reside within the 1400 foot circle of influence as um, laid out earlier in the site plan. I'd also like to correct uh, something that um, my father, Richard Bazzano, said, nobody on Arata Lane lives within a thousand feet of this proposed uh, cannabis grow. We live within a few hundred feet of this proposed cannabis grow. If this is going to affect us more than anyone else, and all of us that live on that street also make our livelihood on that street. We're farmers, and and until there's an actual study done on the effects of growing cannabis around walnuts or cherries, I don't think it's responsible for the Planning Commission to even consider trying to move this forward. Um, regardless of Mr. Dravon, who, quote, said, this smell is ubiquitous in our neighborhood, this smell is not ubiquitous around Arata Lane or around Baldwin or around Fairchild. Um, I'd like to move on to the issue of security. This cannabis grow and processing operation is being proposed in an ag zone with residences built on, on neighboring ag zones immediately to the south and the east. San Joaquin County Sheriff has, has said in their recommendation, and this was left out of Mr. Driven's um, mention, he said that there was a 24-hour guard required. San Joaquin County Sheriff said there's a 24-hour license and armed guard that they recommend. So at this point in an ag zone, surrounded by other ag, ag properties with residents on them, we're going to have a, 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 a hired guard with a firearm patrolling the borders immediately adjacent to our own properties. As somebody that grew up on those, in those orchards and it has a child that I like to walk through those orchards, I cannot imagine seeing a strange man with a gun walking right across a wire or barbed wire fence from me. That I have, and I, I'd like to back up. I have nothing against cannabis or the cannabis industry. I just think that this operation is being proposed in the wrong place for it to exist. Um, back to security. I would also like to say that, um, you know, aside from the fact that there's going to be an armed guard walking around with a gun, bordering our property, the reason why the San Joaquin County Sheriff is proposing that is because they have concerns about who may be trying to enter this property. 
And as Robert Migliore said, people, you know, potential thieves, trespassers, people that intend to do harm, they don't have to go through the front door or the gate on Livonia Road. They can just park on a rat of lane and walk 100 feet through the orchard and be at this processing facility. Lastly, I would like to talk about criminal activity. The CEO and CFO of, of Sunshine, Kevin Chen, stepped down only two and a half months ago as he's under investigation by the San Joaquin County Sheriff. The other permits that, that this company has received for grow cannabis in San Joaquin County and Modesto surely all happened before Kevin Chen came under investigation. So using the fact that they've already gained permits and uh, per Mr. Driven been you know, a responsible business owner, that was before these facts and accusations came out. And I'm curious, how do we trust this company to be a good law-abiding neighbor when the CEO literally just had to resign for operating illegally in the same industry that he's telling us he's going to operate legally in now. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, tigers don't, don't change their stripes. And I, I just don't actually believe that, that this gentleman is, is, and this company that would employ him is, is going to operate above the, above board. Furthermore, uh, to support Mr. Harum in the, um, application, the San Joaquin County Sheriff said on February 3rd, 2022, this permit should be put on hold until this criminal case is resolved. So I just don't even see how this can go forward. Um, I know I said lastly before, but I'm going to give you one last point. And this was something that I, I did um, contact uh, Commissioner Krensky and, and implore to him. Like, I know it's not in the Planning Commission's bailiwick, but there's a, it, there's a, a matter of humanity that comes with, it, with this. I mean, put all yourselves in our position and consider that not only are you changing the culture of an area, which cultures change, that's fine, you're putting at us, uh, putting at, putting us at risk with both the value of our agricultural crop and our ability to sell it, as well as security. And we don't know what what type of criminal this cannabis operation would attract, but we know it's one that is that is grave enough that the San Joaquin County Sheriff would require an armed guard patrolling along our boundaries. So I appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I, I had to come to the coast as it's my grape harvest as well. And uh, I, I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other uh, opponents online that would like to speak? If there's anyone else participating through Microsoft Teams or dial a number, this is your opportunity to unmute and address the commission in opposition to this project. I'm seeing no other online participation. Okay, let's hear the uh, rebuttal by the applicant and or the representative. Chair Gransky, thank you. Uh, well, it's nice to see Mr. Harum again. I believe I had one coffee with him ahead of my first ever land use hearing. Certainly didn't have a month's long correspondence with him. Uh, but to address some of his comments, uh, the nuisance against grapes and cherries, this point is absolutely moot and irrelevant. The smell from cannabis does come from the terpenes that are produced from cannabis, uh, ripe cannabis, in fact. But this results from outdoor and greenhouse operations that are exposed to the outer atmosphere, where those terpenes can then travel, attach themselves to wine grapes or any other crop, and permeate the skin to affect those crops. Here, this is completely indoors. As I mentioned, the air inside of these Interior grow rooms is going to be scrubbed for that odor. There's no exhaust that's going to be expelled into the outer atmosphere. So this point is completely irrelevant. Can I stop you there? Sure. So you're uh, res responding to Dr. Oberholster's 
a quoted statement saying it was only for outdoor use or outdoor growing of cannabis? Saying that the conflict between traditional ag, this has not only arisen in San Luis Obispo County, this has also happened in Sonoma County years prior. It has to do with greenhouse operations and outdoor that has to do with exposed cannabis adjacent to traditional ag crops. I've not seen any precedent for indoor operations negatively affecting adjacent ag crops, specifically in Stanislaus County where there are greenhouse operations as well as indoor operations directly adjacent to traditional ag crops. This has not been a problem whatsoever, and they've been up and running since 2018. Next would be his raising the concerns of the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. We cannabis operators are actually regulated by the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. We have to receive permits not only for cultivation operations, indoor, greenhouse, and outdoor, but also for distribution operations. So as a condition of our certificate of occupancy, we're actually going to have to submit an application to the Air District who's going to have to grant us permits before we can legally operate. So their concerns will be addressed. They will be regulated directly by the Air District itself. Excuse me, I have a question. So how often are you reviewed on your permit? The air permits? I think we have to renew them annually. You, do they come out? They are very responsive to complaints. I know this personally because although our facilities haven't been complained against, we have a retail facility with distribution next to it in Atwater, California, another client does, and it's located right next to a boat manufacturer that uses fiberglass to manufacture their boats, which causes an extreme odor. We lodged a complaint against them, and the Air District representatives responded within, I think, 24 hours of our complaint. So I imagine that given that we're going to be subject to regulation by them as well, if there were an odor complaint, they would be responsive to that complaint as well. Thank you. Next would be our security plan that is subject to Sheriff's Office approval. Now, I don't think I need to remind everyone that the Sheriff's Office is the local agency that's responsible for public safety, who we trust with protecting our communities. I don't imagine, and I have not seen in my experience submitting these security plans to the Sheriff's Office, that they're going to give cannabis operations a pass for having lax security. I know, in fact, that it is the opposite. So there will be oversight over the security plan. I think the Sheriff's Office is the most appropriate agency as the responsible party to determine whether or not a proposed security plan is sufficient. Next would be no trust for the applicant. So Mr. Harum is incorrect when he says the applicant has been indicted. In fact, the applicant has not been indicted. He's been charged with a criminal complaint, and he stands accused and not convicted to Commissioner Rustaller's point. And while I appreciate the fact that Mr. Harum recently read a book on Al Capone, he should also appreciate the fact that the applicant here, the company itself, has submitted this application to a public agency subject to the review of multiple agencies within the county in the air of transparency and with full awareness that they will be heavily regulated. And I'd also remind the Commission that any owner that is going to be a part of this company will have to pass a background check, again, not only at the local level but at the state level. Number five, access to the Fairchild Industrial Park. Now, some of the opponents stated that the access to the Fairchild Industrial Park is open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. In the event that the Fairchild Industrial Park chose to limit access, what we would then do is we would provide a knocks box, not only with a security diagram for public safety officials responding to the facility in the event of an emergency, but also with access keys to that security gate as well as to our facility itself. This, again, is a moot point. Whether or not the location is physically suitable, and this argument he repeated his claims of a threat to the adjacent crops from the odor. And I would just remind the Commission, many of you were here when the Lockford facility was entitled, this is very, very similar. This is a repurposed traditional ag facility that is adjacent to traditional ag, and it is also adjacent to heavy industrial uses, which I think is something that should also be considered. You have an industrial park where you have fertilizer manufacturing going on as well as steel fabrication. So when you talk about property values and you talk about suitability of the proposed use here, this is immediately adjacent to people that are growing crops, which we will be doing, and manufacturers who are engaged in heavy industrial uses. So I do think this facility is, in fact, very suitable for the proposed use. Again, I don't need to address the threat to the crops again. 
Uh, exterior lighting, to answer one of the other opponent's concerns, all of the exterior lighting will be downward facing. It's going to illuminate uh, a perimeter of about 25 feet off of each of the facility structures, and so certainly it's not going to result in any uh, light pollution to any of the adjacent properties. Um, Sideshows, I'm glad that they brought this up. Sideshows, it's uh, where people come out with a bunch of cars, they spin donuts, they cause havoc uh, in, uh, I guess, vacant industrial areas. I have a client on Glass Court in North Modesto uh, who actually, their security infrastructure thwarted this exact type of criminal activity because their surveillance system, their, their exterior cameras, captured the license plates of these people conducting these sideshows. They turned that evidence over to the sheriff's office and allowed them to address that uh, criminal activity. So this is a specific instance where the existence of additional security at a cannabis facility thwarted existing illegal activity. And I, I expect the same to be true here. Uh, there's no manufacturing, as I stated. Uh, a honey lab is a an illegal uh, cannabis manufacturing facility that uses exposed butane to manufacture a particular product. That's not going to take place here. Um, in fact, this facility, although it's only distribution and indoor cultivation, is going to be fully equipped with uh, fire sprinklers. So that will be in place to address any potential fire nuisance. Um, to the other gentleman's concern as to nitrates in the soil, I mentioned there will be no discharge of wastewater into the soil nor into the facility septic system. We're going to capture it have it hauled off site. How much are you going to haul off site? You said you're going to use a million gallons a year. Sure. Um, I would, a million gallons will you be hauling off site? So with drip irrigation, um, it's very negligible. The way that works is we have, we'll set the, the cannabis plants on sloped tables, like basically trays that run the length of the cultivation room. There's a slight slope on those. So as the, uh, as the plants are irrigated, the water will come down, they'll fall through grates at the end of the tables into like uh, basically just plastic bins. We'll take a mobile wastewater cart, we'll pump the bin of the wastewater, the, the, the mobile wastewater cart's probably about 50 gallons. That can easily handle an entire grow room. Then that mobile wastewater cart will be taken over to a, a stationary tank, probably 25 to 5,000 gallons. I'd say maybe three or four times Year max, uh, that 2,500 gallon tank will need to be hauled off site. So, so out of a million gallons, you're going to use all, uh, you're going to recycle 2,500? No, I would say 15,000 gallons maximum. Thousand, okay. Probably. Maybe 20,000 max that, to be safe. So, is that tank on your application? I didn't see it on your application. Uh, I don't believe we designated the wastewater tank, but there's a number of uh, infrastructure and components that are going to be Can implemented. That Can you help? Was that on the application? Wastewater tank? It's in the application narrative. I'm just, it seems like an awful lot of water, and, and I said, so it sounds like you're going to reuse it, like 95% of it or better. Yeah, actually, the, the condensate, so there's two different things going on here. I think you're referring to the recapturing of the condensate that occurs within this uh, controlled atmosphere of the grow rooms. So that's going to be recaptured and reutilized for irrigation where the wastewater that drips off of the bottom of the plants themselves, that's what we're going to basically uh, store and haul off site. What do you do with the excess nitrates? That's up to the waste company that takes it off site. All right, thanks. Uh, if I may, if I think I have some time remaining. Um, as to indoor operations and the nature of this cycle, we know that outdoor cultivation operations have one big harvest per year. That occurs around September, October. Indoor op op operations are cyclical, with each room being capable of four to five harvests a year, uh, with very minimal low yields in comparison to traditional ag. There's no way to tell uh, when a harvest is going to occur. So when you hear the gentleman talk about uh, cannabis crop, him smelling cannabis crops around the same time that traditional ag crops are being harvested, that is an, a full season outdoor operation that is causing that smell. I, I think that is uh, rhetorical evidence from the opponents themselves that the indoor operations are not a threat to traditional ag crops. Um, when I said the smell was ubiquitous, I mean in the Central Valley in October, if you drive down the highway with your window open, you are likely to smell some cannabis growing somewhere. Maybe not particularly in this area, that's a circumstance that will not change because of our odor control measures that are going to be in place. Um, 
As to the guard and, and how he's going to conduct himself during off hours, he will be stationed inside of an interior security room monitoring surveillance. There will be no guard patrolling the perimeter with a gun, um, as was assumed by one of the opponents. Uh, in fact, in the event that there is any type of security threat, the guard will be uh, directed to immediately call authorities and serve in a, a basically an observe um, and report capacity. We're not going to be looking to engage in any gun battles or anything like that um, as part of this facility's operations. So finally, you know, as to the, the repeated uh, claims against Mr. Chen, which he does stand accused of a crime, um, I would just say that this is the company's first entitlement. The fact that they submitted this application to San Joaquin County, again, with the full awareness and expectation that they were going to need to be transparent, as well as the fact that they have memorialized their request and actually demanded the resignation of this individual from the company, speaks to its commitment to abide by the laws and be tra transparent in its operations moving forward. And so with that, I appreciate your consideration, and I appreciate your time, and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Yeah, I've got a couple. Uh, some of the uh, opposition uh, talked about traffic Can you and the concern, on especially the time of day uh, that the trucks will be coming and going and that type of thing and sure. how it could add to the As burden. far as the very early morning hours, that's when some of our employees will be arriving. I'd say that, you know, vendors uh, coming to pick up cannabis or our own distribution vehicles that are going to be dispatched to take cannabis off-site will probably come, be coming and going around I'd say 9, 10 a.m. Um, at the earliest. And with that, you know, in comparison to traffic gener generated by the traditional ag uses going on all around this area, the traffic impact from this particular facility is going to be negligible. This is, an, in reality, this is a very small scale facility with limited traffic. Um, another point that was brought up for those of us who own property, what is going to happen to the property value? Again, I don't know if there has been any studies on indoor cannabis facilities in general, but I, I would just look to the simple circumstances of this industrial park and the existing uses that are going on um, in it. There is a steel manufacturer that's very near to these residences. Again, I believe that there is a fertilizer company that manufactures fertilizer um, in this industrial park. So. I understand the concerns, and I think they, again, stem from the stigmas around cannabis itself, but certainly uh, the uses that are currently taking place in that industrial park, I believe, are, are far more uh, impactful uh, as to the surrounding area than this indoor operation is going to be. One final about the safety, and it came up that the gate doesn't close and it's always open. Could you review again? Uh, what you plan to do to secure that area, especially the gate area? Yeah, so we, the, the property owners, don't have any control on whether or not the gate to the entire Fairchild Industrial Park remains open. Um, I'm not aware of the operating hours of some of those adjacent businesses, but my point was in the event that Fairchild Industrial Park, for one reason or another, chose to close those gates, what we could do to provide access to public safety is to place a Knox box, a Knox box, which is just a small safe, right? You, you fix it to the exterior of the gate. Um, the only individuals that have keys to those Knox boxes are the fire departments and the sheriff's departments. So if there was an emergency on site, they'd take their key to the Knox box there, access, uh, they'd have the code in there, they could open the gate, they could have full access to the facility. As far as the, what we're doing to secure our facility, there's a primary perimeter fence I believe it's uh, six feet tall. That's going to be improved with another uh, one to two feet of barbed wire. And then just within, inside of the perimeter, we'll have a secondary uh, electrified, low voltage electric fence. And that sits about 12 inches behind the primary fence. And it, uh, it stands above the primary fence by about two feet. And these are commonly being used at trucking yards um, around the county and other facilities. I'm not sure if they're uh, in place at other ag facilities. But that is our intent to bolster the security on site as far as perimeter security is concerned. Okay, thanks. Just on the, you know, it's very, it's very vague, but have you heard anything before prior to this from about the PhD UC Davis? It was, you know, if it was a study or if it was anything or if it was just a letter, any knowledge of this at all? 
this uh, having to do with the San Luis Obispo uh, could have a potentially significant impact is the term that's used I, I've I heard of this not out of San Luis Obispo but out of Sonoma County okay um, I it's so San Luis Obispo County also has I think a, a pretty healthy winery culture just like we do in Lodi a lot of the opposition we received on the Lockford project was from nearby winery owners who did not, as well as you know, property owners again, um, who were fearful and didn't want a cannabis facility uh, in their area. And again, I think those jurisdictions they regulate not only outdoor cannabis but also greenhouse as well as indoor. Um, and my experience, it's outdoor cultivation that causes serious odor in the ambient atmosphere, not indoor operation. But in, being in the industry, there's not some wide circulating study or letter going around that, I mean, because like I said, this is vague. There's no source cited or anything. It's just kind of... Not at all. There's some very uh, well-heeled, uh, powerful traditional ag growers in Stanislaus okay, County, in the Patterson area, in fact, where we have several uh, actually greenhouse facilities that have not raised this as a concern. They haven't advanced any uh, man letters, <laughs> civil complaints or anything of that nature. Okay. And Commissioner Hamilton, you said there is a source on this, uh, of the actual? The source from UC Davis, professor. Okay. So in light of what we've heard from Mr. Hiram tonight and from um, the neighbors about the impact, especially those who, who are, they're, they're growers. I mean, they've got cherry crops. They've got olives, they've got walnuts, grapes, uh, would your client be willing to do an environmental impact study? We, we would not concede to an EIR as a condition of, of approval here. I don't think it's necessary or appropriate. The mitigated negative declaration that we prepared did evaluate the potential for impact from odors, and based on the mitigation measures that, that were proposed, which is those carbon filtration units, um, they found that there would be a less than significant impact on the uh, surrounding area. Now, I would concede to, in the event that there is an odor complaint, once we are in operation, we'd be happy to add additional carbon filters to make sure that that was completely uh, addressed. But again, it's... If you had an odor complaint, would you entertain an EIR? If there were an odor complaint, would we, would we entertain a subsequent EIR? I guess that would be dependent on the nature and reasonableness of the complaint. I will add, and this is not on either side, but just for the information on that particular question point, the San Joaquin County ordinance does require that the odor plan reduce any odor, and I'm, I'm reading here, sufficient to ensure that any odor from cannabis is not detectable outside of the premises, so that will be a license requirement of the project itself, and that would be part of their county cannabis license at the local level, and there's a similar provision in the state license. It's an operation issue, not necessarily an approval issue, but just because that question was directly related to odor. And so the threat to us would be that our CUP could be revoked if that were a lingering problem. Are there any issues with it being a private road? Private road. No, we have uh, full access to that road for our facilities operations. We have actually have a license with the uh, the property owner of Fairchild Industrial Park to utilize that roadway. Clarification on that, possibly. I can address it in terms of the uh, Title Four requirements for commercial cannabis facilities, on which. The Title IX requirements are based. There is no requirement that it be on a defined public road in regards to if they are less than 2,000 feet, the locational criteria um, that Elisa raised, there's an analysis, and that des describes certain types of roadways, but there's no requirement that they be on, quote, public roads. And it would be a requirement of building and fire that that road <clears throat> maintain a standard that a fire apparatus can get access to. So if it became in disrepair, they would have to repair it. That private road is probably 60, 70 foot wide. Lots of access. 
And is there is there a document that I just missed in our packet that has the original doctor, what Dr. Anita Overholster had sent or anything? Because I didn't see it if there is. Is there anything in our packet or anything? The only, the only thing we have is um, from Mr. Harem. Got it. Okay. All right. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, public hearing is closed and we're gonna bring it back to the commission. Uh, something on the traffic. Uh, there's gonna be traffic no matter what's put there. I think, I'm sure there's traffic with the olives. Uh, They're gone. Yeah. I think the commission, you know, the board of fire but there was a minimal amount of traffic. But I mean, with the, in, in the industrial, there is some industrial over there. I think there is gonna be some traffic no matter what is put in there. I don't think any owner of any warehouse should have to sit with anything vacant. I don't see the traffic being a huge issue. Um, I do think on, on something on the on the controversial, or maybe cannabis, I don't know, I don't wanna single cannabis out, but we should expand some notifications, especially just the people that did get informed on this, it looks like they almost all are here or contributed. Um, I don't know how we can measure that in the future, but. If, if you want to, to do this, and it doesn't need to be a, a, an action item, but you can direct staff to explore, specifically in the draft development title, enlarging the notification area for commercial cannabis projects if what the discussion is leading you to, to say, this is the type of operation. This isn't a standard ag project and therefore we want you staff to explore a larger notification area for commercial cannabis projects. Absolutely we can do that. If you think it's sort of double or something like that, um, what that would do is we would have specifically Megan Aguirre look at it in part of the draft proposal and that can be a discussion point when that comes to the Planning Commission on the 20th. Yes, next planning. Does commission. the rest of the commission kind of agree with that? That we well, should... yeah, I, mean, I think you should throw in commercial truck parking. You should throw in wineries, because you, if you want to open up a winery, you're only the only neighbors are going to get notified where they're 1,400 feet. And music goes a long ways out in the country. So you know, you, you talk to. I've been on this planning commission for over 20 years, and you hear people call call me and say, "How come I wasn't notified? You, know, you live 1,400 feet." I think we could definitely discuss that in the future. I think it's a, some valid points. There's many there. items I think that have come before us that should be to exceed the 1,400 foot. Well, I think it's I mean, our power at, to do something about neighbors, it, sounds look like. Look the neighbors at this project that weren't notified. There was a bunch. Definitely add that to the discussion when we bring the development title before you. Any further discussion up here? I got a few comments. Um, there's going to be some odor. I, I don't buy into this. And I don't know how many of the commissioners visited the site. Navoni Road is a private road. Gates laying on the ground, so you can go in there 24 hours a day. If you want, you can go dump your trash at the end of, end of Navoni Road at night. You can race your cars. There's no security. You can call the sheriff. They're not going to come for quite a while because you know, they're limited resources um, there's cherries pretty much to the to the be with to the south and to the east of this project and cherry orchards have no fencing in them so you can drive your car through the orchard or you can walk and you'll end up on a rat road in front of these folks home the other side you have the railroad tracks which is Baldwin Lane that comes off of 26 it's a big dumping ground, and you can ask public public um, public works. They go out there weekly picking up trash. This is Baldwin Road is only to this to the south of this project, probably maybe 200 feet. These are quiet country roads. It's not there's you see you see a car going down, and it's not a neighbor. But, farm roads, and not a lot of traffic. Um, there is an issue on the, on, the, on the backup at Highway 88. 
Fairchild Road, that's a big issue. You're adding, you're adding to the, the problem by another facility. I had a few more notes here. Um, the, the bulk of the industrial plant, if you've never been there at night, pretty quietly, it's not well lit, it's dimly lit, it, gets, it serves a purpose. My concern about this is the facility, it's gonna be well lit, and it's gonna spread out, even though it's wide, it'll, it'll glow quite a ways in the neighborhood. And this is a country, country I said that the one folks, these elder folks that come tonight, they live within 100 feet of it. Their backyard's gonna be. My feelings are, you're gonna smell it, you're gonna see it, there's gonna be traffic. Wind blows north and south. I always said on this commission, and I hope the other commissioners agree with me that you have to look at it and would you want this in your backyard? Would you want this within 14 feet? I patient. Well, all good points. Um, the hard part is that yes, Bono, I agree with you 100 percent. I believe the cannabis gateway drug. But unfortunately, the state of California had a proposition that legalized marijuana growth and the sell of cannabis. And it's not in our purview as commissioners up here to say my personal opinion, how I have to make a judgment. And um, well, I think Mr. Frensky said it it, it, this is a very controversial uh, business. It's in its infancy. It's uh, upon, uh, incumbent upon us to review what's in the packet, look at the recommendations from staff, and, and yes, I hear everything you're saying. And I would say if this does pass, I would make it quite clear to Mr. Dervon and his client that you could fulfill all your commitments. And one of them is uh, the lighting. I, if I lived within 100 feet, I would want to make sure that the light wasn't shining into my backyard. If I uh, had a two-story house, I wanted to make sure the lighting wasn't going to be shining in on, on me. Uh, it's... These are tough decisions for all of us when we're here. I, and uh, we have to make a, a decision based on what we've got and, and take what we heard from you. But ultimately, we have to do what is uh, stated in code, recommendations. That's how we make the decision. Mr. Mitchell, anything? <clears throat> I understand your concern. Um, if I lived out there, I would have the same things that you are. Um, but they do have a plan for the odor. And if there are complaints, then they would have to remedy that. Uh, or they wouldn't be able to license. Um, also, the traffic, I don't think that it's going to make any difference with the traffic, whatever goes in there. Traffic. So at 25 to 30 feet, doesn't seem like a large amount of traffic. I know they'll still have the employees coming and going, and they'll add some, but whatever is there is going to add traffic. I'm in favor of that. Yeah, as far as, uh, you know, would I want to live next to it, it's it's not my, it's really not my job up here to decide that. I wouldn't want to live next to this, if I'm being honest, just like I wouldn't want to live next to a winery that has events or a chicken ranch that we've had issues and voted for. But if it's appropriate for the land use there, which I think staff has agreed that it is, I don't see a lot. The greater issue is, I'm just curious what's in this, 
you know, like I said, there's there's nothing there right now, but I will be looking up this uh, UC Davis situation here, this letter, to see what's going on, because that could have a broader ordinance possible, right, situation. If there was some indoor, depending on what they're found, we could probably research that, right, staff and... I know the issue of ag compatibility and, and turpine, I think that's the right word, impact on ag was considered in the larger adoption of Title IV, and ultimately the board adopted a policy that allowed indoor, not outdoor, specifically whether this um, PhD's statement was considered. I don't remember that in the consideration. Um, but if you do want it considered as a policy, certainly that's something that can be raised to the board. Okay, thank you. I think we've uh, heard from anyone, unless there's anything else. Seeing nothing, do we have a motion? Make a recommendation motion that we um, forward the negative declaration, attachment F, mitigating board of supervisors with a recommendation. Forward the mitigation monitoring and reporting plan, monitoring and reporting plan to the board of supervisors with a recommendation of approval. Also to forward the development agreement, PA. Board of Supervisors recommendation of approval. Forward the findings of the use plan. Findings for the use plan to the Board of Supervisors with recommendation. A motion, do we have a second? Oh, there's one more. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry. If if your goal is to yes. is to make the motion consistent with the recommended action, there is number five. And to forward the use permit PA dash two. One zero zero one six four with the conditions of approval, attachment J, conditions of approval, staff report to the Board of Supervisors with a recommendation of approval. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Second. I think the oral roll call. Commissioner Roostaller. Yes. Commissioner Midgley. Yes. Commissioner Hamilton. Commissioner Saga is absent. Commissioner Grunsky. Yes. Item passes. Moving on to other business. on here the end of the agenda also the appeal period for this agenda expires on October 17 2022 at 5 p.m. and the appeal fee is seven hundred dollars seven hundred ninety nine dollars can you come to the microphone recommendation is my understanding would automatically go to the board this item does go to the board so there's no need for an appeal Oh, that's true. It is going to the board. Yes. Oh, yeah. I don't have to, I don't have to confer jurisdiction by appealing. It's going because it's a recommendation. Correct. Somebody asked, and I said where it was, and yes, that's right, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Thank you. Above my pay grade, but thank you. <laughs> Clarifying. Thank you. Sorry about that. We're going to on to uh, other business. Um, I want to give everyone an update on some board of supervisors happenings. So, Viaggio Winery, uh, the appeal was withdrawn at the September 27th board of supervisor meeting. Um, and then we have upcoming um, items going to the board on October 18th. There's a general plan amendment, zone reclassification, minor subdivision um, that your uh, planning commission approved on 721. There's a zone reclassification, major subdivision, and zone re and a 
two zone reclassifications and two major subdivisions that your planning commission approved on August 4th. Uh, it's located on Park Lane. There's a zone reclassification on Main Street that your planning commission approved on August 18th. There's the development title um, amendment that was adding additional timelines for approval of um, applications that your planning commission approved on 818. And then there was the general plan amendment, master plan amendment, specific plan three amendment, zone reclassification and site approval in Mountain House that your planning commission approved on September 1st. So our, um, <laughs> our October 18th board agenda is very large for planning. <laughs> I just want to give you a kind of a heads up and then we'll let you know how those, how those come out after. Very good, thank you. And then we have upcoming planning commission meetings. And at the end, I'd like to kind of get a poll on if people are going to be able to make the November meetings, if you know offhand, or the December meetings. If you don't know tonight, that's fine. You can um, send us an email. That's fine. So our next meeting on October 20th is the development title update. So it includes the development title update, some zone reclassifications, and general plan amendments. So that's for the entire general plan or the entire uh, development title that we brought some study sessions back to you guys for. There's also a development title text amendment to amend chapter 9-1080, uh, which is agricultural mitigation. And then there's a one-year time extension for a previously approved um, truck stop. So far scheduled on November 3rd, Planning Commission is a one-year time extension for a commercial retail plaza in Mountain House, a major subdivision Mountain House and revisions of approved actions for two uh, major subdivisions also in Mountain House. On November 17th, we have a general plan amendment and zone reclassification on Eight Mile Road and Mickey Grove Road in Lodi and a major subdivision located on um, Highway 12 and Locust Tree Road. So I don't know if any of you know your schedules right now, but if anybody knows they won't be available for any of the uh, November or December meetings, the December meeting, I have that offhand, pull up the calculator, or the calendar. The first. So December 1st, and then December 15th would be our two December meetings. I may not be at the December 1st one. Okay. It just helps us try and figure where to schedule and not have any last minute cancellations. I'm leaving the next day for my daughter's graduation. She's getting a doctorate in physical therapy, so. Okay, so congratulations. Commissioner Midgley? Okay. Thank you very much. We will let our applicants know, and if we have to reschedule anything, Schedule. If any of you think of any other dates that you didn't think of offhand, feel free to email us. That's all I have. Any planning commissioner's comments before we get out of here? I just, if we could follow through with the uh, alerting more people to the situation, I think Commissioner Hamilton has some good points there. Can I just clarify the three that I heard, and, and certainly I think what we're going to ask Megan to do is look at project types that have had large-scale opposition or we've had a large amount of comments and and staff can kind of maybe look at those and go on this type of project we know we often get a larger number of letters and that may be considered but the three that we talked about tonight were commercial cannabis projects wineries including events but if they don't have events do we think music. anything with amplified music okay so amplified music so uses that allow amplified music wineries with events, and commercial truck parking. There will be more, but those are the three we've kind of flagged tonight. Any others that we want to make sure that we flag tonight? Okay, because it really does help when you as um, commissioners who are hearing those comments then say to us, this isn't enough, because we don't always have that input. So that was really helpful. We have expanded. It will go, it definitely will. Really? Okay, well, you know what? We're breaking the sound barrier. Well, and currently they're done by zone in terms of if a project is in the ag zone versus residential, but I think what you're raising is that it should be a project type of notification because of the impacts of a project type specifically in a rural 
County. So that makes sense. Right. Yeah, staff had a good report. The way the report was laid out, it's very glaring. You know, today you see the residence is not. Well, it's, it's very it's unfortunate. Like, it's, it's, you know. I mean, yeah, there are going to be some people upset that weren't notified. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think Commissioner Hamilton's term is up in December. If we can get that done, possibly before he's. Well, we, we can look to wrap it into that update of the development title. Yeah. It would be coming to you guys on October 20th, and then it's going to the board, I believe, on like November 29th. Yeah, so I, that, think it's I think it's important. I think with the amount of kind of contro you know, controversial things we've had to, to extend that out because we've had some really good community input the past two, and it sways decisions. It makes things, sure, it makes things harder, but it does make a big difference. I mean, it's Absolutely. one of the biggest things. Anyway, that's all I got. I'm asking hard questions on the 20th because I won't be here. So only easy questions <laughs> for my sub on the 20th, okay? <laughs> you got it. Thanks.